Kia ora, Maruri Lee, Tala Falaba, Nisan Poromanake. Kia ora, and uh, welcome uh, to all, and thanks for joining us here at Community, uh, Community Research March webinar. Uh, community research is the place uh, to find webinars, research, and resources for uh, the Tanaka Whenua community and voluntary sector. The knowledge and resources that we share via webinar, newsletter, and on our website are all focused on helping community groups to work more effectively to improve equity within our communities. We also invite everyone to share the research with us um, by uploading it on our website and so that community groups uh, throughout Aotearoa can benefit from your work and tell your friends and families as well to be kept informed of up and coming webinars and other great resources, please follow our Facebook page and subscribe to our monthly e-news. Uh, throughout the webinar, we invite you to post questions uh, for our guest speakers for today on the Community Research Facebook page or on the Zoom chat window. Uh, it's with great privilege and honour to uh, welcome our guest speakers for today. Uh, we have uh, on the far left, on my left, uh, Dr. Daniel Hernandez from the University of Auckland, a lecturer within the School of Anthropology, and also uh, Dr. Apua Brosa uh, from the University of Waikato and HRC recipient as well. So, hello, lads, and uh, before we, uh, we we get into our, our uh, webinar, uh, let's have a drink first, because I know we're, uh, we're set here, ready for to, to share our great knowledge around Kara. And for those who are tuning in, if you're here to uh, for clarification, if you're here for better understanding or better meanings, yeah. or just once seen something cool. new about around karma, this is your time to please uh, feel free to drop questions in the chat room, uh, and uh, uh, we will uh, endeavour to answer your questions throughout this room. Maybe drink, and we will be. Oh, oh the, uh, the taste of the plant and beverage of the Pacific. I'll get Dr. Hernandez to introduce himself uh, and, his, and how he became uh, affiliated to uh, the Kava culture and also uh, Rosa. And then from there, we will, uh, I'll start facilitating the Dalai Noa. Sure. Kia ora. Uh, my name is Daniel. I've been on the past, but I don't want to take up too much time and space. Just uh, my introduction to Kava was with the uh, one of communities in Utah, in uh, what is affectionately referred to as Cabo Lake City, <laughs> uh, out there in Turtle Island, and been here in Aotearoa now for the last six years, um, and do work with uh, contemporary Cabo groups. Uh, Beth, that's me. Hello. Yo, and Minaka, and Tangua Prosa, Basunikoro, and Anduri Madhuata, Fiji. Um, so, as um, Dr. Edmund said, um, and actually have to say that this is the first time that I'm with Ed since he's got his um, PhD, so um, congratulations to all. Done well. Um, as he said, uh, my name is Aprosa. I'm maternally related to the village of uh, Nanduri in northern Fiji. Um, was born in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, my great great grandmother is a full blooded Fijian. Her name is Andi Mai Malanga, and she married a European. Uh, and as a result of that, um, we've got uh, quite a bit of European blood in our, in our bloodline. I am currently at Tuakaki Waiora School of Health at the University of Waikato. And as Ed said, that I am um, also a Health Research Council, New Zealand Health Research Council funded postdoctoral fellow. Um, it's my second fellowship from uh, Health Research Council and um, really want to acknowledge them uh, for the work that they do, the funding that they have given uh, both Ed and I, and um, they have done amazing things for assisting our uh, academic career. So really want to acknowledge that. Naka. Cool. Uh, let's get to the, the nitty gritty of Dara Noa. Now, first question um, that uh, a lot of people um, will tend to ask from Kava is, what is Kava? What, what is Kava and uh, what is Kava and, 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 uh, and what does it look like here in Aotearoa for our Pacific groups? Just me, is it? Yeah, it's okay. you. Uh, so what is Kava? Uh, what we do know from um, ethnobotany and plant DNA and that type of thing is that uh, Kava originated in Northern Vanuatu. <clears throat> um, it's uh, kava is an asexual plant, meaning that um, it can't self-propagate. It has to be propagated um, with human means. 
And we also know that uh, the first humans did not come into the Pacific until about 3,000 years ago. So right from the beginning, there's this idea that, that kava is a plant of the gods because who was tending it prior to the arrival of humans? So that's where we've got this idea that kava is this plant of the gods. It's uh, a possessant or imbued with mana as in uh, spiritual power. And um, from that, then... Uh, the people as they moved out the Pacific, people as they moved out across the Pacific, they took kava with them because being this plant of the gods and having spiritual power, it must uh, have other things too, such as being a protectorant, something we can use to, um, uh, you know, to acknowledge each other. And on top of that, they also recognized it had a number of medicinal properties. So we've been using it in the Pacific for the last 3,000 years. And um, it's obviously made its way uh, into Pacific diasporic communities. So for me, I have uh, drunk kava uh, everywhere from in a garage in South Auckland to um, France playing where I've, I've been, uh, not, not me playing rugby, but um, with, with uh, Pacific rugby players in the UK, in the States. Um, so yeah, it's part of um, culture and particularly Pacific culture. And probably the last thing I would say, and we're going to touch a bit more on this soon, is that a lot of people don't know that it's out there because kava not being like alcohol, um, it doesn't cause the social issues that go along with alcohol. So often people don't even know, well, you you people listening probably don't know that you've got neighbours up the road sitting every Friday, Saturday night in their garage drinking kava because it's something we do quietly. And okay, uh -huh. next person, I'm talking too much. Cool. <laughs> Uh, my job is asking questions. So um, again, if you're tuning in, welcome to our uh, community research webinar, um, aka our cover webinar as well, where we are promoting and talking about uh, untangling the myths around cover and cover use. Uh, a question to our to our other guest, uh, Dr. Hernandez. Uh, when did you start drinking cover, and uh, and what was your first experience like? So I, I, I was a teenager, late teen, uh, high school, became kind of aware of it um, through the football team and other people who, uh, Pacific Islanders who um, were growing up with the tradition and actually have a relative um, who really brought me into it. Um, and he uh, became uh, connected with other uh, Tongan in particular um, through the military. And um, as I was kind of about to leave high school, he brought me into into the Kava community. And that's kind of how I got my first taste, uh, my first experience. And uh, I think immediately, more than, you know, the taste or or even the effect, um, the biggest impact or the biggest impression I had was kind of the community, the, the feel of, of kind of a, a sense of uh, belonging even, even though I don't have a Pacific Whaka Papa, um, there was a, a strong sense of community and caring, even though <laughs> there can be quite a lot of humor and uh, people can uh, give each other quite a hard time. Um, it, it all felt um, as if it was a place of um, caring and, and kind of connection. So that was my, my immediate impression more than anything else was, was that feel. Mm -hmm. wow. I think that's the thing too, eh, is that um, and people often don't understand the karma doesn't affect you like alcohol. It's nothing like marijuana. So there's no euphoria or hallucinogenic type of effects, which means that we can drink kava for a number of hours and it doesn't change you emotionally. Um, so I think what, um, what Dan's talking about is that when you drink kava, you're still able to connect on a, on a genuine level, have good quality conversations. And um, that's what kava is about. It's about us sitting around and listening to each other and caring for each other because that's part of the kava culture. And that connection that he was talking about is something that, um, for me, is the reason, uh, besides being part of my culture, but it's also a reason why I continue to go back to cover because it's where I get to connect with not just males, but you know, males and females, any gender, all welcome at cover circles. Hmm. Now, you, you've, um, you've touched on um, a very interesting point regarding drugs. And so the next question is, is cover drug mm. which is a which is a perception that out there by a lot of our communities particularly our own uh, that they believe that cover is a drug as, as research over the past years what's your views i think the difficulty here is that the, the reality is that anything that has a psychotropic effect on your body such as tea and coffee 
is technically a drug. The problem is, though, that we often associate drug with addiction and that person sleeping under the bridge who possibly is there, not because they're addicted, but because of other circumstances. But there tends to be this, this idea that comes along with it. And so technically, yes, cover is a drug, um, just as tea and coffee is, but it doesn't affect you, as, we, as I was saying before, from a euphoric or a hallucinogenic perspective. And uh, just before I pass back to you, Ed, the other thing that's worth um, commenting on too is that cover is not addictive. There's piles of uh, um, research evidence to show that, and a bit later on we'll refer you to a paper if you want to know a bit more um, about the ins and outs of carver and, and to provide references for you on addiction and that type of thing. So yes, it's a drug. No, it's not hallucinogenic. No, it's not um, euphoric inducing. Um, and no, it's not uh, addictive. Mm. Uh, and before we, we have a drink, um, <clears throat> the problem out there is that the word drug on its own has a negative perception or stigma behind it. And so uh, painting or, or drawing their gaba as a drug um, that, you know, that sits along other drugs that we know of that has negative consequences to ourselves and the communities uh, that has, has very negative effects that contributes to some of the issues by people that consume gaba as well. So, <laughs> well, we have a drink, sit back, enjoy your, um, your drug, um, <laughs> your tea and coffee, and uh, we'll carry on our dollar more. I think it's worth too explaining to the listeners that at the moment we're, we're drinking kava out of a kava bowl, out of a Fijian um, kano, which is a big wooden kava bowl. We're drinking kava in um, half coconut shells. And I imagine we're probably drinking about 150 mils of kava at each serve. So we've already had what, five or six. And so if this was alcohol, you'd definitely start hearing it in our voice, um, with the exception of feeling relaxed, yeah, I'm clear-headed. Yeah. So that hopefully that gives an example of, of what it's like to be under the effects of color. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Daniel, knowing that you are uh, you know, from Guatemala and you you uh, you grew up pretty much surrounding yourself with the Tom community and and a culture and a, a community group that's almost frown upon uh, looking okay, with cup. Uh, with regards to religion and, and kaba, what's your views on, on some of the impacts that, that it has had on your communities? Well, I think that's a that's a really interesting question. Eh? Like that's something that I guess you know uh, growing up uh, in Utah as a Mormon, um, but not uh, being Tongan myself. Uh, I did, wasn't aware of the stigmas uh, initially, and my first introduction, like that, wasn't even on my radar. Um, and it wasn't until you know, kind of being part of the Kaba community for a while, that I became uh, started to become more aware that there were uh, these different uh, perceptions and stigmas that might be divided across different religious lines. Yet the people that were uh, introducing it to me were all uh, Mormon, also themselves. And uh, it wasn't until I started to do research elsewhere here in Aotearoa and also spending time in the Kingdom of Tonga that I began to see kind of a spectrum of, of different interpretations across people of the same religious background um, and even different practices. And so in the case of uh, Tonga, for example, I found that um, people who shared kind of my religious affiliation were less likely to participate, um, although there were some that we still did, uh, versus let's say like Utah. But the other thing is being in Tonga, right? There's a lot of different points of reference for your culture, right? Like you're literally in the place. Um, you're on the Fonua, the Tahi and the Moana are right there. Um, there's regular gatherings, the language is all around you. And so I imagine that those people who, um, because of the different stigmas that are around it, uh, were able to kind of, you know, not participate in the same kind of way. Whereas in a place like Utah, where the high altitude, dry air, the climate, um, there's not as many uh, people from the Moana there, although there's a significant Tonga population. Um, people are constantly having to explain themselves and you know, correct the pronunciation of their names and um, so on and so forth. Oh, is that Hawaiian? Are you like Mexican? Are you African-American? What are you know? All those types of, of things that happen. And so I feel like in that context, um, even though there were some stigmas to religion, there's a greater need to have a site where you can have this kind of cultural reinforcement, especially in an environment where 
there's less uh, opportunities to do so. Um, and, and there's a lot of different reasons why that stigma exists. I would say that it's quite ambiguous. Officially, there's no global official um, standing. However, within some Tongan congregations, they do try to institute um, a ban on kava at times. However, um, that is also controversial because um, there isn't kind of a global mandate for it. And as we mentioned, as Aparosa mentioned earlier, you know, kava is now a global um, uh, practice. Um, and, and so that has to be accounted for as well. There's other uh, religious denominations also that have different ways of viewing kava and some I'll let Aparosa kind of comment on that because I know he's done a lot more work around that and how sometimes because it's affiliated with kind of the indigenous practices or the indigenous uh, worldview or, or even the ancestral gods, if you will, um, that is one of the points of tension I find also that, that exists. But I'll let uh, Aparosa comment on that. Yeah, before Aparosa continues, um, if you have any, for those who are tuning in, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to drop it in the uh, chat or the Q and A um, chat box, uh, and we will be going through some of the questions later on uh, uh, in our webinar today. A question that's always been asked, um, similar to drugs, is: Is GABA alcoholic? Is GABA an alcohol? Now you've you've touched on. But just to, for you know, for clarification for uh, for those who are tuning in, is GABA an alcohol? And if not, why is it not an alcohol? So no, definitely GABA is not an alcohol. It's the root of a plant of the Pipenfisticum plant. Um, it's not fermented at all. Essentially, all it is is it's the root of the plant, dried in many places. In some places, obviously, what I'm about to tell you is done uh, green or not dried, but across much of the Pacific, it's dried, the root of the plant, pounded up into a powder, put into a bag, almost like a tea bag, um, and strained through water. So there's no fermentation process. Um, I have drunk kava, I, I can't tell you how many times, and then driven through a checkpoint and blown into the bag uh, at police checkpoints, um, which would have shown up if it wasn't alcohol. Certainly not. So um, have I certainly not uh, made it clear, or certainly made it clear? We'll leave that to, the, to the, those who are tuning in. Um, if that's clear or not. And uh, obviously there's, there's, a, there's, a, uh, ex there's extensive research regarding addressing that, that question as well. Uh, there's a question to both our guest speakers here. Now, obviously GABA requires us to kind of leave home and uh, spend some time with, uh, with family and friends around the Kaaba bowl. And there's a perception out there that Kaaba culture takes away and the father and the quality time that should be spent at home. Uh, so the question is, does it? Are you first? I just wanted to know if Dan is allowed to be here. All these married men. I got my visa stamp before I came. <laughs> no, I, I think this is a great question, uh, because um, it is a common um, criticism of, mm. of cover. The way that way that I like to address it is like is like this. I have a friend who games all weekend on their on their. I don't know. I don't play games, but I've got PS3 or five or whatever up to now. And um, nobody blames the controller. I have another couple of mates who play rugby and just are always doing stuff that rugby, rugby but nobody blames. The rugby ball, but for some reason there tends to be this desire to to blame the cover. I can assure you that my wife does not blame the cover; she blames me because it's personal choice that I go to cover, and so it's not addictive. Um, so it's not as though it's pulling me towards this thing that I need to go and get my fix at. It's my choice to go and drink um, cover, and I'm hoping that I'm that I do better and better all the time at considering my family. And uh, you know, ensuring that um, I'm not leaving problems or not living up to the standards as a husband, and I think that's a Pacific value as well. We should be doing the right thing at home, um, so not bailing on our families and going off and and just drinking kava. My wife knows that this is an important part of my culture, um, and so she's happy with that. Uh, but no, I, it is something that that uh, gets blamed a lot is that kava is taking men away from their family. No choice, and sometimes poor choice take men away from their families, not go. Hmm. Hernandez. <laughs> so I would say, um, you know, on one hand, 
uh, it's a very common perception that um, I've become aware of um, throughout the years. And uh, and it's I used to think it was just kind of religious affiliated. Mm -hmm. That was actually one of the main concerns that I encountered uh, within the uh, Mormon Pacific communities. However, um, beginning to interact with other religious denominations within the Pacific communities, I found that it wasn't just exclusive to, to uh, people uh, of the Church of Jesus Christ that I saints, also known as Mormons, but also um, uh, beyond that as well. And I would say, uh, not to take away from that when it is an issue, um, however, I think it, for me, what I've uh, done with my research is try to look at the root causes and kind of to add to what Amorosa has said, look at kind of the larger environment um, or the larger structures, um, as he indicated, right? Like um, the issue of um, kind of uh, gendered power or patriarchy, if you will, is, is definitely not a common invention. It's definitely not a, um, one that exists within the Moana exclusively. Um, and so looking at those larger structures, I think is important where I would say Kaaba um, doesn't cause any of those things, but rather might reveal um, issues within individuals or even within communities. Um, to give you an example, some of the people that I began to observe throughout my research that people would refer to as kind of problematic Kaaba drinkers or heavy Kaaba drinkers. I started to take a closer look at those individuals. And one thing I will say is that that wasn't the majority of the people that I was around, but it doesn't, you know how it goes, you know, the, all it takes is one and then that becomes the perception. Um, but I started to pay attention to those individuals a little bit more. And I found that most of them were struggling with uh, mental health challenges that weren't identified, mm -hmm. partly because of the stigmas around that. Others were dealing with uh, high stress uh, work life, um, uh, emotional traumas that had been unaddressed. And I found that Kaaba was um, kind of, taking place of what people use in other cases to kind of fill in um, an escape, right? And so, uh, again, I'm not saying that Kaaba uh, caused it or, or even resolved it necessarily, but rather revealed um, those tensions that existed within, within those individuals or within communities. So not to take away from the issue, it is an important issue. Um, however, uh, I think we have to look at it from the larger structure and kind of the root causes of what um, positions uh, men in particular uh, within kind of gender divisions of power and labor um, and all aspects of society, uh, including even professional settings and academic settings um, where we might not point it out in the same kind of way. Um, but it's an easy thing to pick on um, because it's other, it's unfamiliar to kind of the mainstream uh, ideas and perceptions of what's considered to be um, uh, the norm. Mm. Uh, before we uh, now I'll touch on uh, a key topic that you mentioned, which is, uh, almost going to mental health. And uh, we have our lovely Jenny, um, who's the uh, Administrator for Community Research. Um, and I see there are some questions here. Um, if Jenny, if you don't mind uh, uh, relaying some of those questions while we speak. Kia ora. Um, so we've got a couple of questions in the chat, uh, comments in the chat window. Um, Somebody said, kava is definitely addictive in the sense that some people cannot go without it. May not be the same addiction as alcohol, drugs, smoking, but there are some that cannot go without it. Um, and then another comment. I miss the kava club that my husband used to have in our garage when we lived in Auckland. I loved hearing the laughter and singing. Thanks for this, Talanoa. Awesome. Um, and then I've got a question, um, a, a question from Joseph. He says, Hi team, can you speak to the benefits you get from kava practice and rituals outside of the cultural practice? For example, social and community benefits, health, if any, benefits, and any other personal benefits you have identified. Thanks. Um, now, I'll get Aparosa to respond to the first comment regarding the addiction, uh, and then we will have a drink. <laughs> to, to calm us down before we start responding in a very common way. And uh, and then I've got a question regarding to, to uh, answer the question by Joseph. Thank you, Joseph, for your question. Um, and I'll be up also to respond back to the addiction. Mm -hmm. Colin. Uh, I thank you so much for your, for your concern about the addiction. Um, yeah, I, I think the difficulty is that uh, cover use, particularly in a cultural setting, tends to happen over multiple hours. And I think there can be this perception, and you know, I'll just keep on going. I think there's this perception that cover is, addic is addictive. 
I've been drinking uh, Gava for well more than 20 years. And this is this whole thing of addiction is something that has been discussed uh, at length in a number of settings that I've been in. Um, and we've, I've talked to people about how do they feel about being addicted to kava. And a lot of the people that I've spoken to are former cigarette smokers. I used to smoke, unfortunately. Um, so I know that, uh, that pull of addiction from cigarette smoking. That has never happened to me and a lot of the other people that, I, that I've spoken to uh, from an addictive perspective. I think there just tends to be this idea that it must be addictive because we spend a lot of time drinking kava. Um, yeah, I suppose that's the only way that I can address it with the exception. Maybe I'll just do it now. There's a, there's a paper that you can download. It's uh, quite easily accessible online. It's called Demythologizing and Rebranding of Kava as the New World Drug of Choice. If you go online, if you put in Demythologizing Kava and you put in my surname, Aporosa, A-P-O-R-O-S-A, this was published by um, Drug Science, Journal of uh, Drug Policy in the UK. Drug Science is a triple peer-reviewed publication. And when I talk about triple peer-reviewed, if that doesn't make uh, any sense to you, it means that it went through three layers of um, critique. It's uh, in a drug journal that's intended for uh, doctors, um, policy makers, pharmacists, that type of thing. Um, so it's got authority. And I discuss at length in there about uh, cover addiction. So please feel free to go and um, download that, have a look at it, and you'll be able to hunt down my, um, my email address. So please come back to me if you've got any more questions on addiction. Mm. Have I addressed that? Is that cool? Yeah, and, and I guess what we'll do, what we'll do is uh, we'll have a drink, but uh, I'll get a browser after the webinar to send through a link, and then we will upload that together with uh, the presentation. And we'll do that on the community research website um, for future reference. Um, we, we are going to have a, a, a 10 second break here. Um, and um, again, we, I've got a question regarding and which will uh, answer the question by uh, Joseph. And uh, yes, we're going to have a taste of uh, the Fiji plant and, and beverage. Uh, so what does cover taste like? Just what I was drinking. Um, it's got a, a bit of an earthy taste to it. Um, this one, I think, has got a little bit of a peppery in a seed, I suppose. Um, but cover is quite earthy in that it's uh, um, the root of a plant. But also, having said that, that there are lots of different cultivars. When I talk about cultivars, if you think about kumara, for instance, um, the sweet potato, we know there's red ones and white ones. At the end of the day, they're all kumara, but they're different cultivars, okay? So there's a couple of hundred different cultivars of kava, and a lot of them taste different. Uh, so there's not sort of one taste to it, but it's quite earthy, and it's not unpleasant. Um, yeah, and, and just, just one thing regarding taste. Now, everyone says that when they've had a, a cup of kava, it tastes like mud. And the question that I, I always put back on them is, what does mud taste like? <laughs> uh, unless, you, unless you've been tackled or high tackled by a Samoan and in a rugby field, then you would know what mud tastes like. Yeah. Anyway, it's going to be eating mud. No, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, going back to uh, a point that was raised by um, Dr. Hernandez and uh, regarding mental health, and I know Aprosa has done um, a significant uh, number of research around this area um, and looking at, and the question is, can GABA support or uh, the uh, uh, of use of value to those with mental health issues? Can we don't answer that. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so at the moment, um, we're working on having a major research um, project funded, looking at the potential of uh, of GABA with mental health. And where the start was, I, I went up to the UK a couple of times and spent. Um, several nights with uh, Fijians who were in the British Army. Um, and they were at a particular barracks uh, at south of uh, London where they come and go from Afghanistan. One of my comments to them over that time was, um, and I'm talking to, Fiji, talking to Fijians in cover settings um, in private homes, tell me your perception of PTSD amongst the uh, cover using um, Fijian soldiers or Fiji, so Fijians who are in the British Army or soldiers of the British Army compared to your European counterparts. And they'll say things to me like, um, first of all, my wife is part of a tight community, so she knows that I'm going to come back 
a bit stressed after being um, on active service. And so she gives me space, unlike my European counterparts in which they come back and sometimes they away for, say, you know, you've been away for nine, 12 months, you haven't been with the kids, it's time for you to start sorting the kids out. Also, too, um, they're telling me things such as they're sitting around a carver bowl drinking carver, which has anxiolytic, on, so I'm talking anti-anxiety properties. So it's drinking something that is making them calm, it's not winding them up like alcohol. So... You could say, well, they're safe medic self-medicating on uh, on an anxiolytic, a natural anxiolytic, which, yep. Um, but what they're not doing is they're not they're not self-medicating on alcohol, so they don't have a lot of the social problems that go with it. Also, too, they're talking with their friends um, who have who may not have been on the same tour as them, but their friends who are sitting in the room have also pulled people out of Humvees with no legs. Uh, sorry about using the illustration, but you can kind of see where I'm talking there. So, there's, so there is this mental health facet to it. So what we're looking at doing is, um, is a major project and hopefully it's going to we'll start mid next year. We're going to see if we can reduce um, PTSD symptomology. So I'm talking about uh, people who have been diagnosed with PTSD, see if we can reduce that PTSD symptomology around the carver bowl using um, Tylenol or talk therapy as part of that. And if we can do that, then applying it to other areas of mental health. So just as I kind of tidy, tidy this part up, there's, um, I have to say, I believe I've actually got really good mental health. And I, I, don't, um, I don't necessarily say that was the case in the past as a result of some of the employment that I've had, but as I've um, reconnected um, in another level with my culture and been able to sit down and talk with people um, I know that it has increased my mental health. And the other thing too is that I tend to drink carver and associate with people who um, they'll, they'll become really good friends and the type of people who say, how are you? And when I just dismiss it, say I'm fine, they go, no, really bro, how are you? And for me to be able to have that level of friendship and to be able to talk about stuff has made a huge difference in my own life. And um, yeah, I don't know if you guys want to comment to that, but... Um, mm. I'll, I'll make a comment and before I hand it over to, to Daniel regarding uh, you know, the social cultural aspects of it. Uh, in, in a study that I did uh, looking at Kaaba uh, from the experiences of New Zealand born Tongans, it, it was seen as an alternative to, and a diversion to alcohol consumption and youth gang affiliation. Um, at the same time, we had a lot of New Zealand born Tongans who entered the Waikaba circle without being able to speak the language. And yet, years on, they're, they're now fluent, and not just in, in the everyday Tongan language, but also speaking the Matapui or the noble chief uh, language as well, which is quite um, heartening that the language and culture uh, is, will continue to uh, be spoken in, in our, with our future generations to come, using supplementary sites like the Whaikawa, and now moving away from the, uh, you know, the traditional institutions of learning, like church and homes. And so I guess a challenge for those who are tuning in in the Pacific space is to look at look within, look within our own cultural practices as a means to revitalize a sense of cultural identity. I know that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of drive that we get our young people back at church and all that kind of stuff. But also look at within your own practices, whether you're Fiji and Samoa, Tongan, Cook Islands, Maori. Uh, and, and see what's out there that can support our young people moving forward, um, particularly in addressing some of these cultural and, and also mental health issues as well. And do you want to comment? Particularly around your research around yeah. uh, music and how it's supported our young people. Sure. I, I think, you know, in regards to benefits, um, you know, I don't talk about everything that's been said, you know, like I agree. Um, it definitely can. However, I will say that I think it also depends. Um, I've been in a variety of different cover circles. And I think that, um, you know, I tend to lean towards the ones that I find are grounded um, with um, knowledge holders and people who are, are grounded themselves. Um, and I think that provides some stability. There have also been in other ones where it just facilitates an escape, um, which, you know, is hard to then kind of navigate or negotiate some of those, those things. So I think the benefits are there potentially, but I don't want to put it all on cover because I think that, it, it's it's mana right and it depends on how we wield that mana or how we uh, operationalize that and i think um, it's really important to have a good group of people um around you in order to do that um and to kind of um, be able to uh navigate and negotiate those things and you know in regards to music you know that's one of the things that i find as well just like or 
or being able to talk story or talk therapy, um, you know, the, how that helps mediate um, and allow people to be open and vulnerable. An important part of that is having people around you that you feel you can trust, that that um, you feel are you are, are you know there for your best interests and care about you, um, even if there's jokes and all that as well, you know. And, and likewise, you know, music um, I found it also has quite a significant um, way of wielding emotion as well, and can really um, help kind of carry some of those things or express um, some of those difficulties, and especially. You know, uh, although there's co-ed kava groups and women's kava groups and a variety of, you know, either gender divergent kava groups as well um, that are emerging, uh, most of my experiences with predominantly kind of men's groups and um, tip my head to the, uh, Dr. Sione Baca and the work he does around mental health and men's mental health in particular, I find that because of the societies we live in, there's particular ideas about what men are supposed to be like. And then when it comes to um, brown men or, or pacifica men, there's there's another layer of what the expectations might be. And it's been really interesting for me to be in a Kaaba group or a Kaaba circle where um, people challenge that and become vulnerable or become open or willing to share. I've seen people cry. I've seen people express love. Um, and I, I've seen a variety of those things happen, kind of a vulnerable openness when you have a trusted group of people. Um, you, you, you know, the knowledge holders that know how to um, utilize Kaaba in a way that um, facilitates that kind of healing, if you will. Um, but again, I don't want to put it all on Kaaba because I think there's all those other social factors and environmental factors that are part of it as well. Um, those are just kind of my mis- the initial thoughts uh, around that. These three, uh, in my study of Kaaba, there was three arts uh, that I um, found, which was the art of oratory, the art of music, and the art of witty. And as specific peoples, the art of witty is uh, something that uh, bridges the intergenerational gap between young people and elders. And in the carver circle, uh, that's an art that is uh, learned. And then uh, as young people, we observe of watching our elders uh, taking the wit of other our needs. So uh, uh, if, you're, if you're sitting there and you struggle to engage your Pacific elders, come in here and, and invite them to a carver circle mm-hmm. and just take the wit out. Now, we're going to have a drink, and Jenny, uh, I'm going to uh, ask you to see if there's any comments or questions uh, by our viewers uh, who are tuning in. And if you have any further questions, please feel free to drop them on the box. Thanks, Edmund. Um, yeah, we've got quite a few questions coming in. Um, the first one is, has there been any research to hear women and children's views on carver drinking? I have come across positive findings on use of kava, and most of these are done by kava drinkers. Would be interesting to hear views of those that do not drink kava. Um, and there's also another question: Can you please talk about women's relationship to kava other than childcare? Um, so fairly related. Um, and then, do you want a couple more now, or in a minute? There's a few coming in. Uh, no, no, we'll, we'll, I'll get you to. Um share all those questions coming in now. Okay, cool. So um, Blair asked, I might have missed it, but can you tell me the fucker papa of the clapping sequence before and after you drink? And Jono Selu says, um, Malalava Litalanoa, can we, how can we be better connecting our young people who feel disconnected from their cultural identity into Kalapukava near them? Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Jenny. And quite timely because we were going to move into the um, the space within uh, GABA and gender. And uh, I'll get Aparosa to kind of share some of the uh, uh, the literature out there regarding the woman experience in GABA, particularly, uh, you know, we're all, uh, you know, everyone looks at Pacific and believe that we're all similar cultures. But there are key differences within our culture and even key differences within the GABA culture. And so, um, for those who don't know, Fijian women are uh, one of the best cover drinkers out there. <laughs> and uh, you don't want to drink too much with them. Okay, mm-hmm. so I'll get up also to share uh, and to respond back to some of those questions as well. That's a couple. Just before we quickly moved into the, the woman thing, I'm clapping. Uh, when we drink cover, that's a sign of respect. So that's a reason that we do that. Different um, groups uh, across the Pacific <clears throat> and even within Fiji have different numbers of claps. But whenever you hear the clapping, that's pretty much what it is. It's a sign of respect. 
Um, the other question was, uh, was another question from the, just after that one, the clapping and then what was the other question? Oh, uh, sorry, no, that was how do we introduce our young people um, into cover circles? Um, we're doing that uh, quite a bit in, uh, in Hamilton and even at the University of Waikato. So, for instance, uh, every Thursday afternoon we have Fono at the Fale, which is for postgraduate students to just come and sit and talk about their research, unpack their methodologies, their specific um, approaches to participants, that type of thing. And we're really encouraging our young Pacific um, um, men and women to come and be part of that and so that they can be mixing and mingling with um, older people such as myself, Dr. Dave Away um, at the University of Waikato and, uh, um, and others so that they, they get to um, interact with older people and then we're then taking them into the other cover circles that are in Hamilton. Does no, that answer that question? Yeah, absolutely. Now, before you respond to uh, the, uh, the question regarding um, women, uh, it is critical that as specific peoples within in Western spaces, uh, and I know that there's a lot of, um, we have a lot of specific people, particularly in the youth workspace. And, and my challenge to you was to uh, constantly disrupt the space that you're in by pushing cultural practices as a means to address these issues that our young people are facing today. Now, and if you're having um, trouble with that, um, allow myself and, and these two here uh, to come in and run workshops and to create a better understanding of kava use and how we can utilize this cultural practice as a means to bridge the gap between young people and elders. Um, it's been done for years, and I believe that if we continue to um, start talking about it and sharing the work that we're doing, that our ancestors have done for years, it, it, you know, there's, there's no issues regarding that. So, it, and again, it just requires education and the raising of awareness to a lot of our, our brothers and sisters out there who just continue to struggle uh, to kind of grasp a better understanding of cover. Now, women, uh, there's an interesting space regarding cover use, and uh, I'll be happy also to share some of uh, the literature and research that he's been able to do regarding this space. Mm, my, uh, so I'll start off with this uh, quick story. My wife and I used to take a lot of young people home to Fiji, uh, to the village. And um, on one particular trip, we had a young lady, she's European, um, and she was leading the team. And she's 18 years old, uh, as I say, European. And she came to my wife a couple of days after being at home in the village and said, oh, sorry, maybe I should preface it too, that um, these young people were taking, came from a church setting. This young lady came to my wife after a few days of being in the village and said, I'm struggling with how um, patriarchal and male-dominated the culture is here. And my wife responded and said, I can understand why you're saying that, but what you probably also need to understand that was prior to colonisation, prior to becoming the missionaries, um, there were women in Fiji who used to lead small armies into battle. The missionaries turned up, and please understand, I'm Christian, so I'm not just bagging Christianity. Um, but my wife said to her that the, you know, the missionaries turned up and was like, hang on, lady, what do you think you're doing? Get into the kitchen and start providing for the family. So I think that there's, there's a whole lot of misconceptions that are based upon um, yeah, different ideas of how women should be in the Pacific. And some of it has been highly influenced by European um, understandings, Eurocentrism. And it's often Europeans that tend to be quite critical of Pacific space has been very patriarchal when maybe we could put some of that back onto, onto those systems and structures. However, putting that now towards cover, there's a lot of women that drink cover. And um, increasingly, um, women, spa women only spaces in the past, I tend to be in mixed gendered spaces. Uh, in Fiji, we do a lot of, lot of that. Um, when I'm talking about uh, Pacific only women uh, spaces, I'm thinking about the Silent Whistle uh, Cover Club that's run by Anao Henry and um, a number of other women in Auckland here. Um, they are uh, professional women, so it's, uh, it's police women, there is business women, there is a lawyer involved. So these are places where women are coming together and, um, and drinking cover. But also for me, um, I've had a long, long history of drinking uh, cover with both mixed men and women. And I, I actually like women being part of the cover circle. I think they bring a good balance. 
think um, us guys tend to be more, let's fix it, where women tend to be more emotional and coming from the heart, and they bring good balance to discussion. So, um, you know, there tends to be this idea that they are male-only spaces. Just the other day, I was drinking kava with probably, maybe the woman numbers were slightly less than the males, but there was a good, healthy mix of um, females. And also, too, when it comes to things at the University of Waikato, we definitely have women as part of, of what we're doing. Mm. I think uh, reg regards to research, uh, there's been one time study that has explored the experiences of partners um, who, of those who uh, of cover drinkers. Uh, and and that, that was a, a master's thesis back in 2014. Uh, I'm not sure if that's uh, available online, but um, if you want, uh, I can ask that individual to share her research. Uh, and with, and with you know, the general audience. And uh, I believe there's other research as well coming out, particularly from a, so from a time perspective, uh, the role of the doa or the kava server is, uh, is a very uh, interesting space to explore. And there's a, there's a PhD uh, research that's been carried out as we speak, uh, exploring the experiences and perceptions of um, uh, Dovas or female kava servers uh, in the town in the kava space, and uh, I guess we're all looking forward to see what their findings uh, is all about and, and how um, that will contribute to the literature within kava culture. Um, the, I think that's an, an exciting piece of research if we can explore the children's views of kava use and uh, how they believe, uh, you know, what, what value does their fathers or uncles or, or, or moms or aunties um, are gaining when um, going out and, and find out. As a result of COVID-19, uh, we had to adapt online. And uh, a lot of our carbon drinking took place, uh, took, took place over Zoom and uh, other uh, platforms as well. So, uh, you know, as we're doing here, uh, we are mixing and you know, there's another box and that's someone else mixing and then you know, although we're in, in the individual settings, we still create a collective fight cover environment through the Dala Noir, through the music that can be shared in the background as well. And there's, uh, there's uh, some research coming up regarding uh, COVID-19 and cover, cover use uh, that can be found uh, online um, on google.com somewhere around the end as well. Now, there's, uh, there's one more question. Uh, Let's just jump in and just make one, one, one more comment sorry, oh, yeah. about, about, about women that in colour. Hmm. To say that there is no, that there has never been or there is no exploitation of women at cover is wrong. There has been. But what I mean to say is that if I'm at those places where that happens, I'll say something and I'll leave. Um, I had a person the other day who suggested to me that cover, cover circles is just a misogynistic spaces where men just go and talk rubbish. If that's the case, I'll leave. I'm not interested in, uh, in going and doing that. So, yes, there are these situations that are happening. In fact, it's not just women that I've seen exploited that cover circles. I've seen um, males as well. I'll say something and I'll leave. So the thing about cover is that it's, um, it's supposed to be about the the whakaturanga, the angofakatonga, the whakasamoa. Cover is about respect. And um, when people, regardless of their gender, are not being respected at a cover situation, as I say, I will say something in leave. Mm. So I'm hoping that just yep. rounds that up. Um, and I hope that rounds it up for, for those who are tuning in. We have one more thing to cover, and that will have to do with something to do with our organs. <laughs> and um, uh, I'll give Jenny to, uh, if there are any comments or questions um, on our chat box, to, if she can share any of those. And um, Jenny, when you're ready, uh, if there are any comments or questions, while we have a drink. Thanks, Edmund. There's just um, a couple more questions here. How safe is kava in pregnancy? And are children allowed to drink kava? If not, why not? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, there's a couple more coming in if you would like to uh, ask them as well. And the new ones are um, really interested to see more research views on from women and children. And what is the connection between kava and the liver? And what are the parts of the kava? Cool. Now, 
<laughs> good timing with the, 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 the love of Christian, which we'll, I'll get up also to share um, that side of the question. To respond to the, uh, can young, can children drink kava? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, I've, I've been drinking kava since the age of 14. And at the time I took my first cup. Obviously you had the same experience when you drink like a long black or uh, you know, you have your first beer and you have that facial expression that is ah, yuck. But when you continue to drink it uh, and enjoy the environment that you're in, it becomes awesome. And uh, I'll get up uh, Hannette and Daniel to kind of share um, his experience um, because he's got, you know, uh, some, some young children as well and, and how he's been able to weave that into his um, everyday life as well. Uh, I'll say, um, just kind of, I guess, generally, with one of the earlier comments as well around like women and children, like I think, at least in my experience, I find that um, the perceptions that families have are often uh, a result of the practices um, that exist within that family as well. So when I've um, been around groups that are, are quite exclusive, then I, I find that that impacts the way that women and children are, are relating to it, where versus the groups that I, I tend to prefer to be around where um, wives and, and daughters and other sons, et cetera, um, are welcomed into the space or come in and out of it. Um, it's a very different perception that that family will have in relation to Gaba. And, and that's kind of where I tend to lean at just because you know, I have family and kids as well. Um, I would say um, I definitely uh, wouldn't have my kids drink as much as I do um, or as often as I do, but they, when they've asked or were curious, I'd, I'd give them some. Um, again, they have smaller bodies um, and are still growing. And, and, you know, I think about the other examples. If you're somebody that drinks coffee or tea, you know, think about when you would find that appropriate for your kids and thinking about it in that sense. Uh, but my kids have tried it um, as they get older, they'll have a little bit more as they go. Um, and part of that is as they learn also kind of uh, balance and respect um, around those things. Um, and likewise, I do the same with sugar. You know, like I'm very cautious as to um, how much sugar access my, my kids have. I would think that that one's uh, um, much more harmful and dangerous, yet it's so easily accessible and, and uh, we have uh, have that quite a bit. So I would say that's kind of my initial approach and thoughts. Um, and so I, I try to create a space too where when people come to drink Gaba or when I go, um, that my, my family feels that they're part of that um, and that they can be if they want to. And that's what I like to lean to. Not everybody's like that, but that's kind of where, where I find um, uh, like where, I, where I find the most alignment with personal. Mm. Oh, you know the thing I really like about about young people and uh, fathers that bring their sons to cover, even that, even when they're like seven, eight, nine sort of years of age, is that these young people are seeing how men, if we just want to start basically with men, how men interact as adults, have decent discussions. But when women are there, they're also seeing how men can maturely have platonic relationships with women and have quality conversations. And what we're doing is we're modeling that respect and that type of thing. So that's one of the things that I really appreciate about, um, about having those uh, younger kids there. And also that they can look to us as uncles and aunties and know they can just come and talk to us whenever they want to. So, yeah. Mm, absolutely. And um, I guess... Let's, let's move on to the hardy stuff regarding <laughs> organs and, and the question that was put as uh, regarding liver and uh, yeah. Okay, so early 2000s, um, some uh, people in, uh, the, up in Europe who were taking carbon tablets uh, were reported as having uh, or experienced liver damage. And um, that led to what is called the uh, European cover ban. Now, what we need to make clear in that there is that there's a vast difference between cover tablets and uh, cover as we're using it at the moment. Cover tablets involves the extraction of, uh, or most often the extraction of six of the major um, cover lactones. And in Europe, in the early 2000s, that those carbolactones were often extracted using alcohol and acetone. There's now a belief that, uh, that that extraction process caused a chemical disruption to the carbolactones, and that was what was uh, likely to be a contributor 
to liver damage. Um, there were a couple of other factors, but well, that was a key, key factor. Um, what we know is that kava, as we drink it, um, we're drinking it now, or when the kava lactones are extracted using water, there is not that same issue. So if you were to type into Google, kava causes, the first thing that's going to pop up is liver damage. And there's been a lot of um, material has been published on that, which that tends to overtake um, the, 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 the positive or the factual. Um, that's another thing in the paper that I discuss, uh, the Carver Health paper, which we'll put up online. But probably the best thing to do is to read you a comment that the World Health Organization um, made in their Carver Risk Assessment Report in 2016. So if I read this to you, it says, this is the World Health Organization. On balance, the weight of evidence from both a long history of use of Carver beverage and from the more recent research findings indicate that it is possible for kava beverage to be consumed with an acceptably low level of risk. In that same report, the WHO also compares damage from kava to your health compared with Panadol or over-the-counter um, pain painkillers. Kava is safer than Panadol. So I know that's going to be controversial for some people to hear, um, from a safety perspective, but again, please grab the uh, or download later on the um, demythologizing carbon paper. It's all justified there, not from my perspective, from a systematic review of the literature. So I'm talking about other people. I'm just collating them to a paper. Cool. Okay. I hope that um, to be real quick. Yeah. So just I, I'll mention as well because uh, this is something that um, Abros has brought up at other points. Is that there's also a lot of different kinds of carbon, mm. <laughs> all of which have different effects mm -hmm. and so that's something to keep in mind as well like you know we've been referring to kava but there's um, hundreds of uh, varieties um, all which have different effects and can be used in different ways medicinally as well as socially and so just kind of keep that in mind as well um, mm -hmm. you know, what kind of kava are we talking about you know is, is another factor for for those who may not be as familiar with that and, and, and don't be scared to ask if you're going to participate in the kava session or kava ceremony um, please do ask where the cover is from, uh, and to kind of get a better understanding of then what to do next. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna have three more minutes. Um, if you have any final questions, um, fire them through to the, uh, the chat box. We're gonna have a drink. I'll get Jenny to um, to come and share the, the comments or questions. Um, so I know if you're if you're tuning in, your keyboard must be going hundred miles. And just while we're doing that, and Jenny's about to come back to us, the only question that wasn't answered was in relation to pregnant women and children. Oh, yeah. um, so a pregnant woman in Fiji often will drink kava. They say that you can tell a baby when it's born whether or not the mother was drinking kava because the skin uh, tends to be a lot smoother than other, ba than other babies. And yes, because of the medicinal properties in kava, young children are often given sips of kava. It has a uh, mild antibiotic and a mild... Um, um, antifungal in it, but you can read a bit more about that um, on the papers that uh, we'll load up later on. Hopefully that answered your question. Jimmy. Okay, um, there's a couple more questions. Carva and prescribed medications. Should carver drinkers let their medical prescriber know? And what is the rationale behind eating when drinking carva? Okay, the difficult one in relation to letting your uh, doctor know is that there often is this tendency to jump immediately to, we don't, so I'm talking about from a GP's perspective, and I've discussed this with a number of GPs, there tends to be this, um, I don't know, so therefore don't do it, I'm talking about cover. If you, do, if you were to talk to Fijian doctors, um, they're often a lot more relaxed about it. We do know that there's the odd interaction, and from memory, I think, Carver and St. John's wort should not be taken. Please do not take carver if you're taking SSRIs, which is uh, a certain um, type of, um, of depressant um, uh, medication. So you and also you don't take carver if you are taking benzodiazepine um, because they sort of act the same. So you're going to get sort of a double dose. Um, was there another question on top of that? What was the other question? Uh, the, the other one was chases. Oh, so chases. Um, a lot of people do eat things when they are when they're dr drinking kava. For me, I think pears are my favourite. Um, where people tend to eat a lot of uh, salty things because we're drinking water and eating a lot of lollies, we're trying to encourage people to stay away from that. But yeah, my number one is to eat pears of all things. I'm not sure you guys have. Yeah. 
yeah, we've got your pairs. Um, <laughs> Making my pairs. Yeah, so uh, chasers is a big thing. It kind of just chases away the, uh, the bitterness of the carver, but other than that, it's, uh, yeah, we try to, try to stay away from the sugary drinks that everyone has. Um, our time is up, but I'm going to just quickly go around um, and just get any final comments regarding carver, and then uh, if you have any final questions, uh, we will be able to answer them after the webinar. Oh, I just say there's heaps more that <laughs> we weren't able to cover, obviously. So just kind of keep that in mind. Hopefully, we've given a decent introduction, especially Dr. Borosa. Um, but that's, that's it for me. Malo, Thanks, brother. Um, yeah, as uh, as Dan said, there's so much more to this, um, like layers of a massive onion. Uh, if you want to read uh, more about kava, um, some of the research I've been doing on kava and driving, um, more about kava and health, um, you can also go to aporosa.net. And um, all my research is on there. So, yeah, help yourself. And if you've got any questions, please flip them through. And um, Toko, thank you so much for uh, for having us here. And uh, we're going to continue to keep drinking Tava well after these people are gone. Mm, absolutely. So if you're tuning in and you're here in Auckland, uh, please feel free to come down to uh, to Otara, to MIT Pacific Community Centre. Uh, come along with your food and then we eat it together. <laughs> um, again, thank you again to Dr. Daniel Hernandez uh, from the University of Auckland. Dr. Apoa Brosa from okay. the University of Waikato for sharing their knowledge and insights uh, with, you know, regarding the plant and beverage of the Pacific. And uh, again, thank you again, Community Research, for allowing us to carry out this mm. webinar today. No. Um, for, and tune in to our uh, up-and-coming events and webinars uh, with Community Research. With that, kia ora, stay safe, be kind, and uh, remember, keep scanning as well. Thank okay. you. Ooh. The Community Research website offers a hub for good community research and researchers. It's the place for the public to find and share evidence about effective community practices. The website collects research and evidence and organises these so that they can be easily accessed and used by other groups. You can access this research and browse by category, by a list of quick link topics, or by searching for something specific. All of the research is free to download. The Community Research site is all about excellence and effective practices. You can view recordings of past webinars and find out about future ones. The webinars share evidence about what's working in the community sector. Published by Community Research in 2007, the Code of Practice provides the standards and guidelines for doing research. It's the place to start if you're thinking of undertaking research with or in a community or iwi. As well as the collection of research, we keep a register of experienced researchers who are skilled at working with iwi and communities. To find a researcher who can help you, we have a filter system which allows you to find people based on location, qualification, ethnic group and area of expertise. The Community Research website is a unique resource for the community sector to use and share. It matters because communities who learn well will do well. It matters because it evidences what's working for us. For researchers and community people alike, we've made it as easy as possible to share your research on our website. Kowa e Fakama. Uploading material is quick and simple. Save your work as a PDF and head over to Share Research. Answer a few questions that help us tag and organize the research so it's easy for people to find. If you're a researcher and skilled at working with communities, you can add your details to the directory of researchers so that you can be found. Community research keeps you updated and informed. This helps make you more effective. If you want to stay updated about the latest research, informed about new resources and our upcoming webinars, head over to sign up for our e-news on the home page. Community research is a rich resource built for and by the community. For it to reach maximum potential, we rely on you to contribute, participate and support the resource to grow and thrive.